You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for Institutional Advisors. Welcome to the show, Bob. Yeah, Jim, good to be with you. Um, it's been a fascinating uh, opening to the year in financial markets. Uh, everything buoyant and very positive right up to the end of the year, and then the first tra- few trading days, wham, it's like somebody pulled the pin on many prices. Um, the key one being uh, crude oil. Uh, the decline steepened, and they... Um, so you've gone from September, which was sort of the shoulder where it fell off the over the edge and the crude oil price, and for five or six weeks you had uh, the big guys saying that, oh, this is good, it'll help keep inflation in line, and, and then lower gasoline prices will uh, uh, put more, take less cash out of the household budget and all that sort of stuff. So it was all positive stuff. Uh, this was not our view. Uh, I think that crude oil going down, and it turned out to be relentless, uh, along with other commodities being weak, are suggesting that the global economy is not doing so well. And uh, so that's the way to look at it. And then uh, we'd run a chart showing um, uh, the price history of crude oil, with the vertical shaded bars showing the recessions. And uh, the latest one we did that, uh, that one is on a chart back to 1913. And the general conclusion is that uh, a, a bear market in crude oil will likely be associated with a recession. It doesn't say the recession starts the moment crude goes down, but uh, most of them are there. The, the crash uh, that we actually called well was the 1985-86 one and the reason that one didn't have a recession it was just within the markets but the reason when that one was is that uh, tin had had a spike up in the summer of 85 and the tin council was very ambitious and that was let's call it a, a, a cartel and they jammed the price up very steeply and caused uh, some severe short covering. And it was so, and then it failed, of course. And then you'd lost all those bids, all those shorts had covered. And it was so bad that it, uh, the Bank of England was forced to inject some money into the London Metal Exchange and was quite displeased with the Tin Council. So at that point, one would say, okay, so the Tin Council has got feet of clay. Now, what about? the oil cartel with the OPEC and so that was our reasoning then and it turned out that there was a, it you know that's where I think the high was somewhere around 35 but I think it was somewhere like 31 in November of 85 and then it fell to that 10 level in March of 86 rather breathtaking stuff um, but no recession on that one. That was within a very strong economy that kept going right up until the eighteen, till the eighty-seven uh, hit to the stock markets. Well, that was the Bill Clinton years—eight years of continuous growth that had never happened before. <laughs> yeah, and of course it was due to his brilliant policy. Uh-uh. He just happened to be there. So, anyways, um, so what we found here, and at the first of the year was. The uh, trading community discovered that, hey, uh, weakening crude oil prices maybe isn't a, a, a glad tidings, and the stock market got hit pretty hard. And um, then uh, a few days ago, it got oversold enough to, and in a pattern we call uh, our springboard buy, which it did, and then uh, that was a day or so of stability in the crude price and then here we go this morning uh weaker crude prices um and uh, a very st- soft european stock market i think it was down something like two percent so it's back again so you had two days of relief from it and here we're back again so because the crude is seems to be the the domineering item here now uh we're looking at uh, 
previous crashes and and these items like this where it may this time you know it may be fast it may be long on the decline but so the the i think the sensible way of looking at it is you take the price of uh, crude oil and deflate it by the producer price index and here's some numbers i'm just working on them now 1980 to 85 uh, cyclical bear market uh, in real terms, down 45%. 1990 to 1994, uh, down 65%. And then that, after a rally or so, then it went on, and that bear market actually ran from 1990 to 1998, when it was down 74%. Then you had the cra- July 2008 peak. That peak was, uh, as we've been mentioning, was the the great enthusiasm about peak oil, and those enthusiasts were not looking over their shoulder at what was going on in uh, fracking. So uh, that, but anyways, it was all in the price and deflated. It was 142 was the high, and it fell to 36. That was a 75 percent decline. And then on this one here now, since July. We're down 54% as deflated by the PPI. So uh, it has further to go, we think. Um, and one can't really, when it's this dynamic, if you're, brilliant traders can trade it, but uh, it's difficult. And even then, there's no urgency to get in because it can take two or three months of bouncing around to stabilize when it finally does find the level at which it's going to stabilize. So other than very nimble traders, we just uh, leave it alone. And so long as crude oil is going down, I think the stock markets will down. But what is, uh, and it's, of course, helping the the uh, U.S. Long, long bond, the bond future has been uh, moving up on this, which is good, we think, that it has for the bond future has further to run and uh, uh, needs to get higher on the weekly RSI. But we're looking for what we could call ending action. Where, and then I was writing the other day and thinking back, and those of us who were in the markets in the late 70s and the relentless rise in interest rates as then the focus was on CPI inflation and wage inflation. And, of course, you had the huge bubble in gold and silver then right up to 1980. And you had the U.S. long treasury up to 15% and uh, yield, and that was unprecedented. in, In 300 years of history, the senior debt in the senior country. The worst was in England and and the threat of a Napoleonic invasion at 6.5%. And here you had uh, the long treasury up to 15% in 1981. And the irony, Jim, is that through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the treasury was buying bonds out of the market and beginning in the late 40s to prevent interest rates from going above 3%. And then uh, in the mid-60s, they intensified the buying. They called it Operation Twist, and that was to keep it from going above 6%. But it was their own exercise of constantly buying bonds out of the market that was injecting cash into other markets, and people then were choosing to speculate in commodities and producer prices and wages uh, and consumer prices. Everything was going to the moon, which blew out in 1980, and then you had the shift over into speculation and financial assets. And I remember, Bob, back in the early 80s, uh, mortgage rates hit 21%. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the government of Canada long bonds got up to 19.5%. So here we looked at the posting the other day on the... German 10-year note yielding 0.46%. Well, 
I don't remember exactly, but I'm sure that uh, back in uh, 1980, when Government of Canada bonds was heading for 19.5%, there would be days when the spread between the bid and the ask might have been half a point. <laughs> now you've got the German 10-year note down to just half a point, 50 basis points in yield. It is, there, there's been nothing like it in all of financial history. It, and, it's, and it's actually caused by uh, central bankers and with interventionist theories, economic theories, and they've, they've become absolutely fanatic with this thing, and they keep applying the same thing. But we've noted that <laughs> despite the huge recklessness of easing, commodities ain't, are not going up. They're going down. You had, earlier in the week, copper set a new low. Uh, you know, this is, and yet this is, there are, they've stated that they want to have inflation up to 2%. And, uh, oh, no, this... I think they're, of course, within here. So let's let's put ourselves in the, at the desk of a uh, central banker, eh, the Federal Reserve, and you're 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 imbued with all of the theories about intervention and in central banking and fiddle this and fiddle that, and you'll have wonderful results. So they're there now, thinking they're heroes. They're going to prevent deflation, and it's been happening. But the other half of it, and I'm sure this is really becoming maybe more than half of the rationale, if you can call it that, is that they've got this theory that their brilliant manipulations can bring good times all of the time. So I think that half of the, at the moment, half of the effort, the intensity, is to prove that their theories are right. And it's you know, as a historian, it's fascinating to watch. And at some point, all of this incredible speculation in financial instruments burns out. It was like at some point in, 19, in the late 70s, all of that speculation in tangible assets would burn out, and it did. And then that's when you had the long treasuries at 15% yield, and now they're all the way down to 2% yield. Um, so it's, it's, it's so symmetrical. It's opposite to the conditions that prevailed in 1980. And um, I know that and at the time in 1980, nobody believed that inflation would end. Most portfolio managers were all down to maybe 22% cash, that sort of thing, and, and very worried about inflation. And uh, then because something similar had happened in, in the 1920s, you had a huge blowout in commodities in 1920, and then you started the bubble, the 1929 bubble. So our view, and then in 81, 82, was that no matter how much the Fed printed that stocks would outperform commodities and it, the street just couldn't accept that well that thing about continued inflation i remember sun life guaranteeing that if you bought a policy that after five or six years it would make enough interest that it would pay for itself and that of course ended with a massive class action lawsuit against them because that didn't happen oh yeah no they couldn't continue that guarantee and yet you know the street still considers, the economic side still considers that it was something that Chairman Paul Walker did in 1980 that, that ended inflation. But if you take a look at money supply numbers, the growth of money supply did not change. And you had a commodity crash similar to what happened after 1920, and Paul Volcker wasn't there in 1920 to end that inflation. So this is, you know, this is how poorly researched mainstream economics is and and all of these guys are are running on theories that are basically intuitive and not based upon empirical evidence and it's no wonder we're in such a strange space here where you've got german yields down to less than half of one percent so anyways let's enjoy it while we can uh we'll try to make the trades coming up after the break bob hoy will explore what might happen to gold more and more people are looking to the Internet 
for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome back. We're speaking with market historian Bob Hoy. Bob, what is gold going to do in this market with crude prices falling lower than a snake's belly? Um, this is fascinating because a couple of weeks ago, there was sort of a brief hiccup in the financial markets, and on that day, uh, crude was down, stocks were down, and gold and gold shares were up. And I thought, oh, this looks different because you got to go back to t- 2011, and that was the height of that 10-year bull market for gold and silver. And even the major companies were doing very reckless and foolish things. So um, that one was blowing out and uh, under huge, uh, intense speculation. So then you've been in this long, long collapse in uh, down into here now. So our, if we go back to um, Christmas a year ago, we noted that... Um, Many commodities, including precious metals, were really oversold, and we could get what we called the rotation, a good rally out to spring or late spring sometime, and various sectors did do that. Then that was also, uh, they got aboard gold and silver very quickly, um, and the the supply-demand analysis guys, the fundamental guys, came out and said, oh, here we go, this is it, gold's going to go to the moon. But the silver-gold ratio got up and overbought, and that gave the other another sell signal. So now we're going the opposite way. And, and so from 2011 to recent, you've had a bear market in the precious metals sector. Now, that coincided with the great bubble in financial assets. And uh, so the party there is this opposite thing. And throughout a lot of financial history, you can see where if you're in uh, a bull market for uh, the big New York board, golds will be down. And if you're not, then golds can go up. So this is working opposite. So here's the day that your basic gold bug could not fathom a few years ago when you got a, another decline today in, in uh, crude oil and uh, you got gold and silver up. I love it. So it's becoming the alternative alternative place to be. So... As orthodox investments in in stocks, in uh, high-grade bonds, uh, rolls over, I think this is going to release a cyclical bull market for the gold sector. And uh, so what we've been looking for here for the last five or six weeks is for stability in the sector, and that would be indicated by gold shares outperforming the, the bullion price. And on the chart, that's been looking good. And this week, it broke out beyond the 50-day moving average, which is constructive. Then also, you'd want to have uh, silver beginning to outperform gold. And that has been struggling a little, but it looks like it's trying to turn positive in here. And that would be another plus. And then the other one would be to have the uh, gold shares outperforming the S&P. And that is is developing as well. So it it's looking good. And our advice has been to begin to buy a little on on the weaker days uh, and decline, but not to get really aggressive in it. Let's just let this thing develop because at some point, maybe in the next month or so, uh, the pull down in crude oil and S and P and stuff like that could be enough to kind of put a lid on or even set gold stocks back a bit. But So then let's then step back and say, where are we going to be six or seven months from now? And I think by then, the gold market will have uh, set it, sorted itself out, weathered whatever storms may be in the financial markets and moving on. Because this storm in the financial markets, the storm in the commodity market, whereby and particularly crude oil is falling relative to gold, uh, is typical of a post-bubble deflation. And uh, so this is where we always emphasize, if you want to trade gold in dollars, you're playing a currency game. 
But if you want to be an investor in gold shares, you want to watch the real price of gold. And it's been really moving up since the low, which we took a cyclical low in June. And our gold divided by commodity index has moved up a lot, and particularly the last few weeks with the weakness in crude. And it's easy to understand that a weak crude oil price represents the energy costs of mining. And uh, with gold doing reasonably well, at least stable in U.S. dollar terms and and, uh, commodities falling, this is uh, feeding into better profit margins for the gold miners and eventually this rise in the real price of gold will pull up the shares in the gold shares and so longer term we're very positive on the sector and we're not so positive on the orthodox side stocks and bonds but you know we'll look for we we got the trade out of the uh junk bonds in June or last year and now we're looking for the trade out of long treasuries, and when we get there, we will discuss it. Bob, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Good to be with you. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for Institutional Advisors. Their website, institutionaladvisors.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is TalkDigitalNetwork. Comments about the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.